Danielle Fritzi, she is a, a transplant surgeon and associate professor at the University of Texas right here in San Antonio. Um, and she's going to be talking about localizing uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and multifaceted approach to HCC in South Texas. So with that, Danielle, thank you again for agreeing to come and um, kick her off. Thanks. Um, I'm actually really glad for the opportunity to, uh, to speak here today. And I'm um, particularly happy that, uh, that this meeting is right here in San Antonio, which has been um, my adopted hometown for the past seven years in a city that I've really come to love. The, um, with the river walk right out the window, um, it seems appropriate to talk or to focus on a topic that has a, that has a particular San Antonio flavor. And um, maybe unexpectedly and certainly unfortunately, uh, today that is HCC. Is this a clicker? Do that. Um, and so in 2012, Dr. Amelie Ramirez, who is the chair of our population science uh, department, was assessing trends in HCC epidemiology. And she observed that not only is HCC um, at, uh, at much higher incidence in Texas than in the rest of the United States, but that that uh, increase is even more profound in San Antonio and the surrounding areas. And so as, as a person in the transplant center right up the road, a part of the cancer center right up the road, what do we do with this knowledge that we have a disease that's disproportionately impacting our patients and disproportionately impacting our community? Um, and for us collectively, it really felt like a mandate, um, unofficially so, but nonetheless, to really take the bull by the horns, uh, so to speak, and own this disease. Um, as our responsibility. Um, so to try to understand what's going on, um, to educate our community, and then also to treat HCC as well as we possibly can. So I wanna share what we've been up to for the past 10 years or so, uh, what we've learned, where we're headed, and uh, I also wanna be really clear, this isn't, this isn't my work, this is the work of uh, the medical community here in San Antonio. Um, and. Uh, so to begin, uh, we'll get a little bit more specific about where we're starting. So this is what the data actually looks like. And we see that HCC, does this point? It does. Here's a pointer up there. There we go. Oh, that's good. Pointer. Uh-oh, what did I do? <laughs> All right. Um, so this is incidence of HCC over time, so increasing across all groups. And you can see that uh, for Hispanic patients up in the blue box, the incidence is about twice that of non-Hispanic white patients. And then additionally, this is the uh, line of incidence for Texas, um, which is about 50% higher than in the rest of the United States. And the top bar here is South Texas, um, so specifically San Antonio and the surrounding communities. And if you look at the Rio Grande Valley, which is south of here and along the border, that's also an area where there is a disproportionately uh, high incidence of HCC. 
Um, so something's clearly going on here. I think the questions are really, what is it and what can we learn that can help us to better serve our patients? So um, maybe the obvious theory is that there's simply more liver disease. More people have chronic liver disease here and that uh, ends up leading to a higher burden of HCC. Um, other people have postulated that perhaps there are some genetic factors at play or maybe instead uh, there's something in the water, metaphorically speaking, some environmental exposure uh, that is unique to this particular geography. And what we know is that we really do have high rates of chronic liver disease in this region. So higher rates of hepatitis C, low rates of, hep uh, low rates of hepatitis C screening, um, NAPLD, and alcohol use are also significantly prevalent. Um, but we also know that Hispanic patients who have chronic liver disease, and in particular hepatitis C or NAPLD, are more likely to go on to develop HCC. And that may have some roots in genetics. So PNPL83 is one of the most well-studied genes involved here, and uh, it's associated with increased fat deposition in the liver and progression to advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis. And uh, specific polymorphisms that uh, are associated with higher risk are also uh, highly prevalent in Hispanics in South Texas in particular. Um, and this environmental exposure theory may actually have uh, some, may also have uh, some uh, foundation in reality. So aflatoxin is a known carcinogen uh, that can impact the liver and it's rare in the rest of the United States, but it is present in this region of South of Texas in particular and associated with the development of HCC. So HCCs that are associated with aflatoxin exposure uh, tend to carry a hallmark mutation in TP53. And so MD Anderson actually looked at their series and um, to essentially assess this theory and found that about 7% of Hispanic patients had tumors that carried this particular, um, this particular mutation. Um, and what was interesting was that T53 mutated HCCs uh, were associated with younger age diagnosis and also a shorter long term survival. So it's hard to say that it's hard to blame all of South Texas HCC on, um, on aflatoxin, but there is data to suggest that it may play a role in at least some tumors in some patients and that it may be a poor prognostic indicator. Um, so Dr. Ramirez and her team considered all of these different types of factors and uh, put together a case control study of patients with HCC at University Hospital here in San Antonio and then match controls. And um, what they found was that there were a number of differences across several different domains. As you would expect, uh, patients with HCC were more likely to have cirrhosis, were more likely to have hepatitis C. Um, NAPL did not quite reach significance, but alcohol use and, smoke, and smoking did. They also tested all cases and controls for um, aflatoxin exposure, and that uh, was significantly more uh, common in, in patients with HCC than without. Um, but they also saw significant differences in some social determinants of health. So for example, patients with HCC um, were less likely to be insured than the controls. And so I think all this comes together to say that probably what's going on here is multifactorial. There's no single thing that we can pin it on. However, there's, there's also still a lot to learn. So in light of that, and seeing so much HCC in our clinical practice, um, in 2012, uh, the, uh, the uh, transplant center actually developed or uh, initiated a biorepository. So we began banking samples of HCC, the adjacent uh, hepatic parenchyma, and blood from patients with HCC at the time of either biopsy, ablation, or, um, or operation. And over the past 10 years, we've collected hundreds of different samples, and those have been dispersed to researchers both at UT and our own institution, and also across the country um, for um, various different projects. And these are a couple of recent papers looking at HCC tumor genesis uh, by Dr. Lutzi Sun at UT um, in partnership with uh, Simone, the transplant uh, 
search engine like Google. So we're hopeful that work like this and work by um, investigators across the country will help to continue to move the needle forward on understanding the uh, HTC uh, pathology. Um, another another endeavor um, in that to that same end was this vision of trying to bring up lots of different HCC researchers, clinical experts together in San Antonio in an attempt to foster collaboration, generate new ideas and partnerships. And that led to uh, the birth of the San Antonio Liver Cancer Symposium about three years ago. So we brought in clinicians, brought in researchers, and had a full three-day program of scientific presentations, panel discussions, and networking opportunities. And the audience uh, annually draws people who have HCC as a particular clinical or academic focus, as well as members of our medical community, um, gastroenterologists, primary care professionals, uh, et cetera. So it serves as a dual scientific and also um, educational role. And we take, the, we take the educational component of this HCC mandate really seriously. So um, in partnership, uh, with local hepatology groups, we've been we've developed specific educational events. We have an APP and nursing oriented CME event annually, where we're always talking about HCC. Um, the gastroenterology and hepatology uh, community convenes every several months to go over um, to have a good dinner and also uh, go over more recent uh, data um, in. Uh, in hepatology, HCC is almost always part of that. And then um, we also go to uh, communities outside of San Antonio. Um, so we have a, a footprint um, for clinic, for hepatology clinic uh, in El Paso and down in the Rio Grande Valley, which gives us a gives us a platform and a place to bring people and also to go out uh, in speaking about hepatitis and HCC. And more recently, University Hospital got a um, got a big grant that was really aimed at improving uh, health literacy related to hepatitis C um, screening, education, and then to take patients and help to get them plugged into primary care and also to uh, hepatology follow-up for ongoing care for liver disease when it exists. Uh, I mentioned hepatitis C. I think that you know, perhaps the perhaps the best treatment that we have for HCC is to prevent it before it starts, either by preventing the development of chronic liver disease or treating it early. And um, we we're fortunate to have a really wonderful partnership with the Texas Liver Institute, which is a hepatology group in town who also um, serve as transplant hepatology faculty for our transplant center, and they bring this ton of uh, expertise in clinical trials, and so they actually ran the first uh, direct-acting antiviral uh, medication trials out of Texas Liver Institute, and um, have continued to work on pharmacotherapy for HCC, for uh, hepatitis C rather, and also moving into um, medical interventions for NAFLD. Um, and so that has been an absolute asset to our community in terms of you know early access for patients to um, to uh, you know, investigational drugs and pharmacotherapy, as well as their expertise in treatment of, uh, of hepatitis. So, for patients who do develop uh, HCC, um, it's our responsibility to treat these patients as well as we possibly can. And so, for us here, that's taken the form of the Texas Liver Tumor Center, um, which is essentially a multidisciplinary clinic. Um, that's designed to provide really streamlined patient-centered care. So a patient is referred and we gather all of their outside data, including imaging and pathology slides, and then bring them in for a single day evaluation. So they came with hepatology in the morning and they have updated imaging labs that are indicated. And then at noon, all of their data and cases reviewed on a multidisciplinary tumor board. Um, in the afternoon, then patients meet with the representatives of the tumor board to review those recommendations. And then each member of the treatment team 
who will be involved in their care, whether that's interventional radiology, transplant accountability surgery, um, oncology, uh, the transplant social workers and dietitians are there as well. And so by the time they leave, they have a written treatment plan, they've connected with their team, and um, if surgery or additional procedures or diagnostics are indicated, those appointments are made and dates on the calendar. As surgeons more specifically, we've also been working um, to try to make sure that we're providing the best care we possibly can. So um, things like we've got an enhanced recovery program that's been um, integrated into our practice for several years, and we've more recently been transitioning basically our entire acute practice to, um, to minimally invasive and uh, robotic. And we're always working to expand access to transplantation in, in all of these different ways, but our programmatic focus has really been in living donor liver transplantation. Um, so particularly for patients with HCC who um, are, you know, have more recently uh, been receiving less weightless priority uh, than in the past uh, in the new allocation system, this can be a really important means of access to transplantation. Um, and that's been, I mentioned, a, a clear programmatic commitment and has required both institutional commitment and development of additional infrastructure to support and allow it. Um, but where we stand now is that every patient who's undergoing a transplant evaluation also needs a living donor, um, the living donor team, for additional education um, and uh, a discussion about living donor and liver transplant as an option. A couple years back, we uh, developed a donor champion program, and that has been a really wonderful uh, asset, source of education and support to families um, and patients trying to identify a living donor. Um, options for paired exchange and chain, chains. We did a paired exchange this past week, and we've had just a remarkable number, number of altruistic non-directive donors uh, come forward and donate to complete strangers, and that has been not only you know a wonderful uh, opportunity for the recipients, but also it's been um, an inspiration, I think, to the transplant center. And so many of these uh, non-directed altruistic donors have become advocates for organ donation and willing to share their stories publicly. So I think it's um, been a great source of awareness and inspiration to the community as well. Um, and Kind of as a result of all of this, we've seen the, uh, the living donor liver transplant volume increase by about tenfold over the past five years. Um, and that, I think, is a service both to patients with HCC as well as people uh, with, an indication, with another indication for liver transplantation. So this is a bit of scratching the surface, perhaps, of what's going on with the HCC in San Antonio and the surrounding community. Um, but when, when I'm speaking about HCC, I often close with this particular slide, um, mostly as a reminder to myself of, of why we're here, which is that this is a disease that's impacting our patients and it's impacting our community. Um, and with that comes both opportunity and also a significant responsibility. So I close in a similar way today, but also with the recognition that um, I imagine many of you in this room have the same, you know, are deeply in the same fight against HCC and serving your own patients with that same um, commitment and passion. So thank you. Um, I'd like to recognize uh, these many colleagues who have uh, made significant contributions to this and then um, all of you for the chance to share this um, bit of the San Antonio story. Um, and I hope that you all have the chance to really enjoy all the rest of what San Antonio, especially on Cinco de Mayo, has to offer. So, thank you very much. Um, Danielle, that was, that was great. Um, and thank you for giving us sort of this overview. I have two comments. One, it seems that, um, you know, your group sort of recognized an issue, um, noticed it, brought a lot of minds together in a way that was very thoughtful and collaborative and then it really sort of taken that to you know the top level in terms of being able to offer such a wonderful multidisciplinary approach um, have you noticed the difference in the outcomes of 
uh, people that have your transplantation in, um, with HCC, you know, before and after you kind of ramp this program up on there. A tenfold change in your liver, living or liver volume is impressive no matter what, I mean, that's just very impressive. But ha has there been, like, I guess my question is, any hiccups along the way? How has this um, changed what, you know, what you're doing, like over the last five years or so? Yeah. But again, very impressive, very impressive. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think that there's there's a couple of things that, that I see. Uh, number one, we're working on putting together our series of uh, HCC patients and living donor and disease donor liver transplants. So that that's forthcoming. Um, but in terms of impact, which I think is part of your question, um, one of the things that we're seeing is a much, we're seeing people show up earlier. Um, and we're seeing a change in the referral patterns of physicians in our community and in surrounding communities. So the chance to say that these, um, that patients with HCC, you know, who might be older than 60 are still candidates, you know, may absolutely well be candidates for transplant. So I think that there are a lot of um, preconceived notions um, in our community that we've been fighting about what what a transplant candidate looks like and about where the role is for surgery versus transplantation um, that patients even if they are potentially a candidate for surgery may still benefit oncologically from liver transplant and so that I'm, i've been struck by how important that education of both the medical community and the um, the community at large is to allow for you know, really timely care. Thank you, I have to find out your hand. Yeah, I push the button and hold it until it's green. Is it better? Yeah, better. Mm -hmm. Excellent talk, thank you very much. And uh, I have two questions. I'm from Czech Republic in Europe. And uh, in Czech Republic, it's uh, vaccination against hepatitis uh, B, obligatory. All children are vaccinated. How is the situation in the Texas or in the USA? And second question: In our country, is the indication for transplantation of liver? Uh, uh, the first place is uh, alcoholic cirrhosis. The second place is uh, intoxication of paracetamol, and third is tumor. How is it in the USA? Or yeah, so in Texas? So in uh, response to your first question about vaccination, I think that we are seeing, um, you know, hepatitis B vaccination is certainly recommended for all people, but we're seeing a greater degree of skepticism about the risks and benefits of vaccination of any type um, in the United States. And so for the first time I'm seeing, you know, in the past number of years, I've been seeing, you know, children whose parents don't want to vaccinate them against hepatitis B. Um, so that is, I see that as a potential growing concern in, in, um, in hepatitis care and hepatology care. And then in terms of the, uh, the indications for transplantation, uh, here in the United States we're seeing uh, hepatitis C decreasing as an indication for transplant and alcohol and um, more prominently NAFLD on the rise. And so that, that cross has actually happened already. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. And it's really great to get a local perspective on, you know, we travel all around all these cities, all over the place, and to have a, you know, this great thing happening right outside our door. It's really great to see. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our uh, next uh, presenter is uh, Christina Papa George. From uh, UVA, you could talk, talk to us about uh, normal technical you know, procedure for DC3 organ recovery.
Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to present. Um, I am certainly not a topic expert in this area, but I do think it's a super interesting and exciting upcoming area in our field that is going to start um, hopefully permeating DCD organ recovery. Um, so I'm excited to share this with you. Uh, the reason we're talking about normothermic regional perfusion is because there's a significant organ shortage uh, in the United States. There are over 100,000 patients waiting for organ transplantation. In the last year, only 42,000 organ transplants were done. So this um, growing disparity in organ availability and um, the need grows each year. This has significant consequences for patients on the wait list. Um, and uh, when we look at our organ supply, we see that deceased donor uh, organs have increased over the last uh, 10 to 20 years, and the majority of this increase has been um, accounted for with DCD donors, which is shown in orange here. So, in the last year, for the first, you know, DCD represented the biggest chunk of uh, deceased donor organs, and it was about a third of all deceased donors were DCD. Um, Unfortunately, with an increasing percentage of our organ supply being from DCD, there are significant challenges with DCD organ donors, and um, this stems from the process by which we recover the organ. So a person has decided to be an organ donor, donor withdrawal of life-sustaining treatments is performed either in the ICU or in the OR, and then a period of warm ischemia is sustained uh, during which time the organs are not being oxygenated or perfused adequately as the donor progresses towards circulatory arrest. After circulatory arrest is um, uh, occurs, then there's a five minute waiting period during which additional warm ischemic injury occurs to the organs, and then we perform a super rapid recovery whereby a laparotomy and thoracotomy is performed, um, cannulation is performed, and cold perfusion. And then after this period of warm ischemia injury, there's cold ischemic injury um, prior to transplant. And this is well documented, been shown to lead to increased uh, complications and poor outcomes in recipients of DC organs compared to brain dead organs. Um, so in, in liver transplantation, there are higher rates of early out of dysfunction, biliary complications, specifically this entity of ischemic cholangiopathy. Um, which is demonstrated uh, on this cholangiogram and is significant because it, it often leads to a need for retransplantation. Uh, in kidney transplant, there are higher rates of delayed graft function and graft failure with DCD transplant and pancreas transplant. You know, DCD utilization is incredibly low, but, uh, but there are uh, described uh, higher rates of graft failure and thrombosis. And then, um, and then I think really importantly, um, DCD organs aren't utilized at as high of rates. So in, um, you know, the, the rates of non-use uh, after the DCD procurement is significantly higher than in brain dead. So this is, uh, brings us to this concept of normothermic regional perfusion. Um, it basically is what the name says, but this is a DCD organ procurement technique in which an external ECMO circuit is used to perfuse and oxygenate regionally uh, the organs in situ in the donor's body prior to recovery of the organs. It is initiated after declaration of circulatory death, um, but cannulation of the vessels can occur pre-mortem or post-mortem, and cerebral perfusion is prevented by either cross-clamping uh, the supraciliac aorta or using like an intraaortic balloon pump or uh, clamping the aortic arch vessels. Um, and just, um, you know, uh, there are two forms of NRP. One is thoracoabdominal NRP, which perfuses regionally the heart as well as the abdominal organs. Um, and then the other type of NRP is abdominal NRP, which only perfuses the abdominal organs. And the difference is really lie in where the cannulation occurs, which organs are perfused, and then, um, uh, you know, whether a heart, the heart starts beating again. So, um, in thoracoabdominal NRP, sorry, uh, the most common technique is to cannulate the ascending aorta, so the coronary arteries are perfused, um, and then the right atrium is cannulated for venous drainage, um, and then the the cannulas are connected to an external ECMO circuit with a heat exchanger and oxygenation and um, the blood is returned. With abdominal, most commonly is performed by cannulating the femoral vessels and depleting the supraciliac aorta either with an intra-abdominal 
bone pump or uh, a cross clamp across the supraciliac aorta. And the timeline and kind of the procedure for NRP overall looks very similar to standard DCD organ recovery, um, but with this added period of regional perfusion of the organs in situ. So a donor is extubated, this can again occur either in the ICU or in the uh, OR. Um, their vital signs kind of decline uh, during this period of warm ischemia when they then sustain cardiac arrest. After an observation period, death is confirmed and uh, the patient at this time is either you know, cannulated or the pre-placed cannulas are hooked to the ECMO circuit um, and initiation of this um, perf regional perfusion occurs. Perfusion then can be conducted for anywhere from 45 minutes up to several hours, uh, during which period it's felt that the organ, some of that injury that occurred during the warm ischemic period is uh, reversed and the organs can be assessed in terms of hemodynamic function as well as um, checking labs to assess physiologic function. And then the um, organ recovery proceeds kind of more similar to the fashion to what we would think of as a brain dead recovery. Um, and NRP has really been uh, much more widely adopted in Europe for DCD organ procurement. So we do have quite a bit of outcomes data, mostly from Europe, uh, where they've been doing it for the last 10 years or so. And in fact, because of the outcomes, um, it is in some countries even considered standard of care at this point for DCD organ retrieval. Um, NRP has been demonstrated in the liver realm to be associated with lower rates of biliary complications and improved graft survival. So this is the Spanish experience from 2012 to 2016, they compared 95 uh, liver transplants from NRP DC donors to 117 kind of standard non-NRP donors. They do only abdominal NRP in Spain and um, with risk adjustment and propensity matching found a significantly lower rate of biliary complications. So it went down from 31% in standard DCD, which is a relatively consistent number you see uh, down to about 8% for all biliary complications, which included in asthmatic structures, only 2% for ischemic clantiopathy, which is more on par with what we see in brain dead organs. Um, much lower risk as well of graft loss from 24% down to 12%. And the um, graft survival curve is on the right there with a uh, demonstration of improved graft survival in NRP organs. A similar, similar outcomes have been seen in the UK where this technique is used in the UK, both thoracoabdominal and abdominal NRP is being used, and this is data from two centers that have been doing NRP back since 2011 in the UK. Similar results, they found significant reduction in uh, biliary complications, including an asthmatic stricture, actually no ischemic calantiopathy in their, in their 43 NRP liver transplants, and you know less than half of the rate of early outgraft dysfunction, um, and then improved um, uh, death censored uh, graft survival. Uh, in terms of kidney outcomes, uh, NRP in Europe has been shown to reduce the risk of delayed graft function and improve early allograft function. It does not improve overall graft survival long term, but um, comparing 29 NRP kidneys to uh, brain dead and DCD uh, in the UK, they found a significant reduction in DGF from 35% in DCD down to only about 15% in the NRP group, which was actually less than what they found in the in their brain dead group. Um, and then DGF tended to last longer in uh, when NRP was not used and uh, had a, a higher incidence of being prolonged. This is GFR at 14 days after transplant, the GFR was nearly double in the NRP group compared to the non-NRP group. And as I mentioned, there was no difference in kidney and graft, and graft survival. In terms of pancreas transplant, NRP has been used with pancreas transplant. Again, this is not pancreas, DCD pancreas transplant in general is not a widely um, used uh, resource, but um, it, it's been demonstrated to be safe and feasible. And, in patients undergoing SPK in um, simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant in the UK um, between um, 2011 to 2019, they found about a half risk of uh, graft failure over a year. So um, the US, uh, again, as I mentioned, it is this technique has not been widely adopted in the US yet. There was 
one or two centers performing abdominal NRP back in the early 2000s, and Michigan published their um, experience, um, but then it was kind of abandoned around 2012, 2013-ish, um, and really had not been performed again in the U.S. until recently with the interest in uh, DCD heart transplantation. So Michigan published their um, experience with 37 NRP donors, they, you know, they procured 21 livers, 13 of which were transplanted. Um, the non-transplanted livers were, um, four were due to technical complications with the NRP and four were due to kind of just judgment and assessment at the time of procurement. Um, their, you know, risk of biliary stricture and primary non-function was 14%, but their end is pretty low here. And out of the 29 kidneys transplanted at their center, they had a 31% rate of delayed graft function and one pancreas was successfully transplanted. And um, the kind of contemporary reports of NRP <laughs> starting to come out in the United States are all related mostly to the abdominal NRP. With the advent of the um, OCS heart pump, uh, there, there was interest in DCD heart transplant in the US and then adoption of uh, this NRP technique and uh, centers are kind of starting to publish some of their outcomes with the abdominal organs that are being procured during both abdominal NRP cases. Not only do outcomes seem to be improved, but organ utilization is increased uh, in NRP. This is UK data. They found significant increases in utilization um, in both liver and pank with the use of NRP, so nearly doubled. Um, the light blue here is the use of an organ, you know, NRP versus NRP. Uh, similar with PANC. It did not seem to affect kidney utilization, which is likely because uh, overall the transplant community is relatively comfortable using DCD kidney and then DCD or uh, kidney pumps are relatively widely utilized. Um, and of, of organs offered, accepted, retrieved, and then transplanted, you can see the green is just non NRP DCD, the red is when NRP is used. It's a, real, a much higher percentage. Risk adjusted based on donors, um, there was about a threefold increase in liver utilization, 1.5 increased utilization of kidney and pain. Similar results were seen in the United States. Um, only this only included this was published in 2023 and included all NRP cases from the initiation of NRP in 2020 through mid 2021, and including 34 um, NRP donors. A liver was about two and a half times more likely to be used. Again, kidney utilization did not significantly change and pancreas was way more likely to be used in clinical if NRP was used. So this kind of begs the question, why is this not just widely been embraced and adopted in the US? And there, have, there are ethical and legal uh, implications that have been brought up and debated in the literature. So when we think about the ethical and legal considerations for organ transplantation, um, the kind of primary tenets are autonomy, which is respect for persons, um, meaning if we, we need to respect the wishes of the patient and their surrogate decision maker at the time of transplant. Beneficence, maximizing benefits and minimizing risk, but probably the one that applies most importantly to NRP is non-maleficence, which is do no harm. And in the realm of deceased donor organ recovery and transplant, uh, this is the dead donor rule is the most important tenet here which states that organ donation can only occur after a patient has died and the act of recovering the organs may not induce death. This seems pretty obvious, but um, that means we have to agree on what exactly death means. In the United States, the definition of death was uh, defined in 1981 with the Uniform Declaration of Death Act, which states that an individual who has sustained either one irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions which would be the criteria met in DCD donation, or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brainstem, is dead. Um, and um, uh, so with DCD organ donation and NRP, we're going by definition one. Um, however, the American College of Physicians in uh, April of 2021 published a statement basically calling into question the ethics of uh, specifically for like abdominal NRP practice. They they felt and kind of represent the side of the ethics argument, feeling this is unethical, that this practice specifically violates the dead donor rule because, 
being declared dead by circulatory criteria requires that the cessation of circulatory function was irreversible. And by definition, if you then are doing thoracoabdominal NRP, which perfuses the heart on an external ECMO circuit, and then the heart starts beating again, they are now having circulation. And therefore, by definition, it was not irreversible. They said this practice should actually be called um, organ retrieval after cardiopulmonary arrest and induction of brain death. The counter arguments to this are that, um, you know, NRP really is supported by respect for persons, um, meaning that all pre-mortem procedures um, require informed consent. So usually people have authorized organ donation already and family members consent to any additional procedures for doing pre-mortem. Uh, and then with regards to the non-maleficence, um, you know, the dead donor rule really is being adhered to in this situation because NRP is initiated after the declaration of circulatory death. Exclusion of cerebral perfusion is not creating brain death. The donor is already dead. They've already been declared dead. And um, the purpose for cerebral um, perfusion being prevented is to ensure there's no artificial reanimation of brain function, not to induce brain death. NRP is an act of organ preservation, not resuscitation. By definition, the, the donor has a do not resuscitate order in place and resuscitating them would not be consistent with their, with their wishes. The two major transplant organizations in the United States support the use of NRP, the ASTS, you know, and the AEST both published statements uh, saying that they believe the practice is ethical and um, we as a community should work to figure out how to implement it. Um, so in conclusion, NRP improves transplant outcomes, increases organ utilization, um, and there is definitely significant increase in the U.S. in adopting this technique, but we're going to have to have ongoing engagement from all stakeholders. Even if as a transplant community we feel that this is an ethical practice, um, you know, public buy-in is of paramount importance here. So we need to, I think, proceed um, cautiously. Thank you. Any questions? This is a very hot topic, and unfortunately, it's said the U.S. hasn't, you know, been popularized, especially from a legal standpoint. We tried to do this actually. I remember about uh, I would say ten years ago mm -hmm. in Region One, and there was a lot of you know obstacles raised even from the OPO that we have to go and get consent from all the recipients who are receiving this work. And I don't know if yeah. uh, any talk. Uh, maybe Dr. Cooper is here. We have some insight from you know, some insight from you know, that with all these ego battles, maybe you over finally. Go on. Yeah, anyone anyway, should hit that early corner over there. Um, so, so, Rick, so the OPTN is looking to put a statement out there that the OPTN never wishes to dictate medical care, but to ensure patient safety and maintain the public trust. And so, the, I think the current opinion out there is one that there are arguments on both sides, both when you look at the ethics for and against. So I don't think, you know, we should expect the OPTN, nor do we want the OPTN to come down on some position on this. My personal opinion about that is that I think this is, you know, exactly what donors and donor families want is to maximize their gift. In my mind, this is the best way, without saying a day, but thank you for that, that you just shown, to ensure that the donor's wish to become an organ donor not only happens, but there's a better opportunity for organs transplanted and to function. Now, I'm just going to comment. The thing I think we have to be careful for is there's been a lot of arguments that say, let's just change the dead donor rule, or let's look at the Uniform Act a little better, let's change the definition. The fear is that that could take away obesity donation altogether. So I think we got to be careful of the wish for it. It's a little like the saying that we should just rescind or relook at ODA. That's a Pandora's box that you've got to be able to get closed. So, I think the, the question is there's still a lot of opportunity for us to think about this. The, the fact that the major societies and transplanters are in support of this is a good thing, but I think we have to continue to be careful and thoughtful as we continue to move the science forward. But great presentation. Yeah, this is, I have a quick question. How, how are things going in, in UVA in your region? First of all, that's great. You did a great job. But so, are, are they, like, how, are you, how is this day to day for you? 
Uh, I mean, we have not implemented this yet. We just got approval from our hospital and OBO to start doing abdominal NRP. There's a lot of hesitance around thoracal abdominal, which is kind of consistent, I think, nationally. Um, and the way we're going to implement it is um, doing it just specifically for donors at our center. Yeah, I think to start in Colorado, there's been some hospitals, you know, don't want to get it, get open, you know, get into this at all. And there's a lot of uh, hand waving and hand wringing really about about this. But you presented it very very thoroughly, so thank you very much for that. Thank you. Oh, Dixon, do you have something? I have a quick question. Uh, Great presentation. Uh, when it comes out to organ implementation, uh, there has been several, I guess, research uh, on the use of genetically modified organ tissues. Recently, I, I watched a documentary on uh, the use of kidneys to procure that way that was actually transplanted into the thigh of the deceased body that was kept alive for an entire month. No signs of rejection. Um, of course, that's a leap forward to what the whole overall goal is. Can you comment about how that is going on and what is the potential future of that? Oh, so xenotransplantation, I guess, is I see what you're referring to. I mean, certainly there have been advances in that field. I'm not sure how close we are to really bringing that to reality in the short term. Um, uh, the, the main competing technology for this is actually the pumps, I think, um, uh, because they seem to show some significant promise in improving outcomes uh, and increasing utilization. Um, you know, xenotransplantation would be, is like the dream, but the, the immunologic barriers are pretty significant, so. Thank you very, very much. We're going to shift gears a teeny bit, or a lot of it. <laughs> Our next talk, uh, talk is uh, by Dr. Tom Bouchak, who is an assistant professor at the University of Colorado. He is a neurologist, but then went on to do a transplant fellowship also at the University of Colorado. Um, and he is an um, international expert in robotic surgery and is going to talk about robotic surgery and transplantation, the technology finding and indication. So Tom, with that, what are Well, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to speak. Um, it's interesting I titled this technology finding and indication because that was actually mentioned to me uh, at one point. Um, you know, I was like, trying to use this technology just just to use it and hopefully by the end of the talk it will convince you that that really is not the case um, i have no disclosures and we're just going to cover three topics and this is going to be more of a higher level overview of robotics where, where this future is going i think in all of surgery and in, in particular in transplant um, so we first need to discuss what is innovation versus a disruptive technology innovation is you're doing the same things, but something has been given to you so you can do it easier and better. Versus something that's a disruption, completely changes the way you think about things, how you learn and, and how you actually do things. And some good examples of innovations versus disruptions, right? We all remember going to Blockbuster and <laughs> movies, and you would drive there and hope that your movie was sitting there on the shelf. Versus now, right, you can stream a movie whenever you want. And these disruptive technologies really have changed the world um, all over the place. But when you look at the modern OR, right, all of these things are really innovations, whether it's an energy device or a high definition screen or hemostatic agents that we're using in surgery, these are really just innovations. They haven't fundamentally changed an operation. They haven't fundamentally um, changed the way we teach surgery to other people. And so then the question is, is the surgical robot, is that, an, is that an innovative tool or is it a disruptive tool or maybe it's neither? And I think in order to answer that question, we need to look a little deeper. We're in an era of big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence is all over the news, chat GPT, this, that, and the other. And in fact, when you look at big data, it changed baseball, right? And by using probabilities, 
teams would shift their defense if there was a, if there was a uh, right-handed hitter, right? And in fact, baseball changed so much that this year they had to change it. So using data, big data, can really change things, and it literally changed baseball. And if we can have this much data on a baseball game, why can't we have this much data in surgeries that we perform every day, right? We have no data on our surgeries other than what's your outcomes, how long did it take you to do the case? And things that we thought were not possible just a few years ago, automated driving cars and a Tesla, is now possible, right? It, the, these machines are processing millions and millions of data points in real time, keeping a car on the road and probably safer than most human drivers. And so when, you, when I ask that question, is, is the robot a disruptive technology? I think it is. And it's, and it's really starting to take off. So this is the My Intuitive app for any of the robotic surgeons out there. I log in to the console, and it's literally keeping track of every second, every movement, everything that I'm doing on the robot, right? And this is a, a kidney transplant I did a couple weeks ago. And I look at this and, because it helps me get better. And when I do open surgery, I don't have anything to look back on and help me get better. And so I can tell you exactly what's going on in every part of the case here. And I can look at this and also tell you where I need to get a little more efficient. And in fact, not only is this machine capturing my personal data, it can then compare me to other surgeons in the country. So here's a, an example uh, case that's in the app, right? It shows me I'm terrible at this operation, not kidding transplant, but this particular operation of it, um, right? And it compares me against the national averages. Who's, who's doing this case across the US? And they're in the top 10%, right? And so now I have data to say, boy, I could really learn and improve my surgical techniques and get better and, and, and really lower my averages. And beyond that, beyond times and instruments and things that are happening in an operation, you're able to capture you know, kinematic e efficiency. And so this is a study that my home um, and others, a lot of this work's been done in neurology and really looking at what, what does an expert robot surgeon do on the robot versus a novice, you know, your, your junior resident. And you can see that the movements and everything are much more efficient, right? These are tracking the arm movements of, of the surgeon's hands. And, and this data, right, in combination with all the other things, you can see how we're starting to build huge data sets of surgeries, right? Both visually with, with what you see on the camera versus what is the surgeon actually doing or what makes them efficient and safe. Image guided surgery is already here. So this is uh, their bronchoscope, and you can see there's a lesion in the left lower lobe. Your task is to take a bronchoscope, go down through the bronch bronchial tree, find that lesion, and biopsy it without a mistake. And so the, the computerized image guided surgery is allowing that pulmonologist to literally, you can't steer it wrong, right? You're, you're going to be there, this is image guided surgery, you're gonna get the biopsy, it's gonna improve your, your results of that. Add in 3D imaging into the, uh, into the surgical console, right? So here's a kidney, it's a 3D model. It's telling me exactly where the blood vessels are. And if I'm gonna do a tumor surgery on this kidney, I am literally have an overlay of the CT scan versus what I'm actually seeing. So I know where the danger zones are. And more importantly, down the road, the computer's gonna know where the danger zones are. And is it gonna allow me to cut that blood vessel or not? Furthermore, you can combine all of this in, into the hub, right? So now I'm getting feedback, artificial intelligence feedback, eventually on my operations. I can be telepresent for a surgeon around the world. They can look into my cases and learn things that I do. I can look into their cases and do things that I do. So we're now connecting um, surgeons from all around the world to share that. And so I think when you combine all of that in, in totality, I would say that in fact, yes, this is going to change the way we do surgery, it's gonna change the way we teach surgery, and it's gonna make, hopefully, surgery safer and, and prevent uh, mistakes. So just to switch gears and say, where are we at in transplant? Well, we're, we're nowhere near where the rest of the surgery has gone. So this data, 2008, it was the evolution of minimally invasive surgery. Lots of things were being done open, very 
people were going to need specialized fellowships in laparoscopic surgery, and robotics really wasn't a thing back then. 2017, this data is old, but you can see there was a massive shift in, in various fields uh, in, in surgery into robotics. And now, um, hernia surgery, 90% of it's being done robotically in, in private practice, and that's sort of mind-blowing to me. Um, so it's definitely been a move in all of surgery, but transplant is not there. The first kidney you have in 1954, the operation hasn't changed in 69 years, right? We do the exact same thing that we did in 1954. But one thing that has changed is that the population in the United States is getting bigger. And getting bigger, I mean BMI, right? So this is 2010, and then in New England Journal, this is the predicted body mass index of the United States. And what we know in kidney transplant in particular is that if your BMI increases, over here in the, uh, the farthest column, the chance, if your BMI is over 40, the chance of you getting transplant is half of that of, of someone who doesn't have a BMI 40. And you have a 22% chance of getting bypassed on a list because the surgeon taking call doesn't want to, doesn't want to do the transplant on a BMI 42 if it's your you know, 10th kidney of the week. And so this is data, you can't argue against it. We know people with higher BMIs have less access to transplant. And whether you look at it in the SRTR data or whatever, the very morbidly obese and the morbidly obese still are on the bottom, bottom rung of who's getting transplanted. And so in 2010, Giannotti and Benedetti at UIC did the first robotic human transplant in the United States. And um, you would think that this would have just taken off in the field, but it really, it's really been a slow take. Um, the case went, went swimmingly, no problems whatsoever, and got a, a young lady transplanted, who otherwise was not a candidate back then. Um, usually the BMI cutoffs were around 35. And so this was really sort of a groundbreaking thing in transplant. But now we're 13 years later and we still have a very, very slow adoption. Europe's way far ahead of us, um, doing tons of kidney transplants robotically. India um, and Saudi Arabia also doing tons of robotic work. And we've had a couple centers um, popping up uh, in the United States as well. And I think that there is a movement there, but Really what's delaying that is scrutiny, right? If you have a bad outcome of the robot, all of a sudden all of your colleagues, you know, you know everybody's talking about, oh, it was the robot, you know, but really over scrutinizing and, and not thinking forward is I think what's, what's happening in transplant. And also there's a huge learning curve, right? You can be the best transplant surgeon in the world, but you have to learn robotic surgery, which is completely different than than you know, open surgery. Here's a review, we know the outcomes are fine, right? Whether it was an open kidney transplant, whether it was a robotic kidney transplant, maybe a little bit of earlier um, delayed graft function or slow graft function, but beyond that, they're equivalent. Um, and that's data going out at, at 10 years now. And what we do know is that this, this is one of my patients. This is a robotic kidney transplant, right? They wake up with a couple eight millimeter incisions and a, and a five centimeter um, Trends of building ones is where the kidney goes in. And they do remarkably better, right? They have no pain. We're doing narcotic pain-free transplant, which is which is crazy. And, and I think that that's why I say it, I think this is the future. A couple more slides here for the sake of time, um, and then if any questions. So outside of kidneys, what's going on in, in the liver world? Well, I had the pleasure of going to Saudi Arabia and, and learn uh, with Professor Roaring. And so around the world, Right? There isn't necessarily deceased donor networks that are set up, or in their particular case, there are religious reasons why deceased donor organs aren't being used. And so he has built a live donor liver program um, where they're doing over 300 uh, live donor livers a year, and with spectacular results, and doing them all the donor operations you know, basically with the robot. And, you know, with live donor, any, any live donor, uh, operation, whether it's a kidney or a liver, the stakes are very high, right? And one mistake in a donor it can be career ending or at least career changing. Uh, and certainly could bring down a transplant program. But once you understand the technology, it actually makes, in my opinion, it makes this operation safer, right? The blood loss is way, way less. The visualization is phenomenal. The energy devices are better. And, and so doing a right low peptectomy is actually, I think it's easier than open surgery. Now granted, I'm biased, I think the robot is, is the future, but 
Um, and even, you know, the, the holy grail of labyrinth liver transplant is when we come through the hilar plate and finding the, the, the bile ducts, right? With using ICG and the technology and 10x vision, in that picture, I can tell you exactly where the left bile duct is and where the right bile duct is. And I can do, I can cut that bile duct with exact precision of where I want, right, without a mistake. And that's what I want for someone who's donating two thirds of their liver. So hopefully I've convinced, um, convinced you that I think this is the future, right? This tool, we can use it to gather data, we can teach, we can improve our surgeries, we can do tons of things, and there will be a time where robots are doing surgery for us, just like our cars are driving. Like that's, it's just gonna happen. And it may not be that the robot is doing um, you know, all, of the, all of the movements, but there needs to be a surgeon there who's guiding the robot, and it's gonna prevent you from making you know mistakes in surgery and hopefully to prevent health. Um, and with that, I think I got a couple minutes left for questions. Tom, that was Tom, that was great. Um, you know, you you've been uh, I, I I guess in a, in a lot of ways uh, kind of like Tom Starzl in our uh, in our group. You know, you're you're, you're, you're uh, he was the first. Uh, person that did liver transplant in our country and of course was out at the University of Colorado and you know you've really embraced this and done an amazing job um, and uh, you know going to be back in Saudi Arabia teaching this uh, I, I think it's just it's absolutely wonderful and the outcomes have been great the question is how to make it more widely utilizable um, because there's limitations on robots, um, there's limitations on expertise, um, there's going to be prevailing skepticism, right? People thought that um, surgeons doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy should lose their license, right? So um, it's like history repeating itself and you are right in the thick of it. Um, so I guess I just, you know, how to move this to the grander stage, more ubiquitous, et cetera, is, I guess, my question. Yep, excellent question. Um, I think, you know, our society, the ASDS and DC, need to embrace this and support the programs. And, and by that, I mean, it's not just, you know, me in Colorado and OTSI and, and Detroit, you know, it's like, we have a committee, and when there's a program that wants to start doing it, that we 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 can support them, and we and we can do it all with telepresence, right? I don't need to fly to New York um, to watch them do a kidney transplant. They can watch me and, and get an ink, understand um, the operation. And so, using technology to kind of educate surgeons um, is, I think, you know, is the way this is done. But it needs to be sort of supported. Maybe there's a robotics committee that gets you know, appointed and overlooks, um, you know, other programs. And because when, especially, you know, there's a lot of talk in the ASDS now of live donor liver robotic appetectomies. And one bad outcome in this country will shut it all down, right? And, and so supporting each other and supporting other programs, um, I think is, is crucial. And, and with that, people will just learn the skills. The great thing about robotic surgery is you can watch and learn, right? Real surgery, you kind of need to do it, but um, you can watch another surgeon and pick up their, their tricks and their techniques, and you become, like the kinematics, you know, you become a robotic surgeon a lot of times just by watching. This was a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you for bringing the robotic talk in ICS meeting. I'm one of the robotic bariatric surgeons at NYU. I was working in our move to become a director in a robotic program. So he started when I was in at NYU, and urologists and gynecologists used to use a lot of you know, 40 cases for prostate, and the robot was sitting idly, and so I was the one who started doing many hours operating, and, so, and then we presented the data and the quality metrics, and we told that we are not consuming a lot of time, and money-wise are also not expensive. So then we started doing bariatric and then we moved there. So my uh, question to you is, do you use robotic technology for harvesting or for 
uh, you know, transfer invention, what is your maintenance? Do you harvest using this robotic platform or you use transfer invention? Yeah, so for the live donors, I, I do all my live donor kidney donations with the robot. Um, I'm, I've learned how to do the robotic liver type things. We haven't done it in Colorado yet, but we will be soon. Um, myself and one of my partners went and studied with Professor Brewing um, to really see how they do it and, and, and actually participate in the surgeries and so um, sort of a mentorship with his program. And so we will be doing that um, on the live donor side. On the deceased donor side, no, um, but uh, I think there's ample opportunity, um, as Peter had just mentioned, about how do, we, how do we train our surgeons? Well, there are a lot of deceased donors out there that we don't use a liver, right? And if you're a program wanting to learn how to do a robotic ribohepatectomy, um, it's feasible to go in with a, at a procurement center and, and do that operation on a donor of which we're not going to use the liver anyway. Um, and, and that's how we can safely gain experience. So currently, no, not, not nothing in the deceased or the procurements being done robotically. Um, and a lot of centers have a lot of interest in, and are moving into their live donor programs. Thank you. Dr. I think uh, the real group was talking about putting some numbers for the proprietorship on these all robotic cases. So I think we have to be very careful where we are going with this. I think with the AI integration into the robotics, things will become a little easier. But the liver group needs to stick to some guns. Okay, minimum of three cases, proper or five cases, we need to put some numbers. Otherwise, it's going to fail. Exactly. Yep, you are 100% correct. It used to be, um, you know, you would go to a weekend course with Intuitive and you came back and you were a robotic surgeon, right? And you had a proctor who would, you know, was maybe a gynecologist watching you do a nephrectomy, um, and and that was that was the training model that used to exist. And you're absolutely right. Like, if we move into, you know, more and more robotics and transplantation, it's more than three cases. It's, yeah, I just it's years. Uh, I just put in our in our department for the robotic paper. You must have three cases proctored by a well trained who has done twenty papers. Yep. So you have to set up some kind of guidelines to go further in these things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if Judy will be interested, right. if Judy will do everything for you, mm -hmm. but we need to put some guidelines here. If we don't have guidelines, <laughs> we'll be in trouble. Yeah, yeah. Sir, you're going to argue with Dr. Mittal? I just uh, to add to Dr. Mittal, actually, and uh, because I have the advantage of stating the neurobotic program in a hospital, so you can't just go and start doing the cases. So it is a policy setup. Initially, what you have to do is as online module courses. You have to accomplish, number one. Number two is like a driving car. You can't just sit in the car and start driving. Then there's a console and there's a simulation exercises. You have to accomplish the simulation exercises with the score of minimum 25% time. And they watch very, very closely. Once you have accomplished these two tasks, then what you have to do is that they take you to observe the cases. After observation, then you go to the gain lab, and then you really practice on cadaver or animal models. And then you have to sit and be proctor for three cases. Yeah, so it's, what I'm doing. Yes, it's last thing, I think. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. one thing for the department, mm -hmm. uh, because I take care of a lot of departments, surgical departments, no? So you have to be very careful when you set them. All those things in will do for you. No, but there's a very strict quality metrics. You can't be just proctor right away. No, no, there should be yeah. a, after the full training and certification by the market. Yeah. Okay. You have to have somebody in the room when you're doing a robotic operation. I think your, your point is valid. We, as surgeons, need to own this technology, right? And we need to help each other with this as people are trying to learn it. It's not, it's not me versus, you know, UT, you know, Southwest, or, you know, you know, it's, it's collectively, we need to help each other to, because this technology is not going away and it's getting more advanced. And if we let intuitive tell us how to do surgery, it's a different story versus us letting us own this, right? Well, the last time, Frank, I just showed a, a 
the temple at different times. I think intuitive sells you a lot of surgery. Intuitive goes around with the local doctors and said, if you don't do the hernia with a robot, even though you can do it for two inches open incision, your colleague is going to eat your lunch. You better get on board with the robot. So there's a lot of marketing that goes into intuitive. That's my snack comment. My somewhat more thoughtful comment is, you know how to do open transplant, right? You, you really know how to do it. I know how to do thoracic surgery. I know how to do it open very well. My point is where we're going with this, as time evolves with the robot and whatnot, it's all been based on the notion, it's predicated on the fact that you know how to do it open. So you understand the surgery already, you understand the anatomy, and not just transplant. You did five years of general surgery, right? So you, you know how to do, you know not just the operation, you know how to do surgery. I fear sometimes with all of the robotic stuff that what we're teaching people to do is we're teaching them how to do an operation. We're not teaching them how to operate. And then very quickly, despite the better visualization, which I've done robotic roles, they're beautiful. You know, that very quickly starts to fall on its face. As we know with the gallbladders, oh, the gallbladder was too tough, we had to abandon, we just pulled the scope out, we just put a drain in and, and wait to come back. You know, when I was in training, when you were in training, there were no gallbladders that were too hard to take out or appendixes that were hard to take out. You made an incision, you took them out with good patients, all got better. Mm -hmm. So the more philosophical question is, as we move forward with this technology, are we starting to unlearn what it took us 150 years to learn, and, and where is that? Where is that taking us? And the last example I give you: the Pantheon in Rome has this beautiful concrete dome with the, with the center out of it. The ancient Romans put that up throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. They couldn't figure out how they did the engineering to do that. They had forgotten what they had learned all along. So I just, as we move forward with technology, and especially as surgical educators, we want our residents to train in the latest and the greatest and embrace robotics, but how do we make sure that we're not losing the basics along the way? Yes. Yeah, I think that's that's a concern. very valid point of concern for a lot of us. Um, and I think that it, your point is even more to like deeper into, into our society. Like, we look at all of the things that have changed for us with social media and the way kids interact now, right? They, they, they have trouble having a conversation. And I think, you know, it's this, we are moving so fast into technology and big data and all these things and make things easier for our lives. And now it's in surgery. And what do we as a society do about that, right? Like, how do we still teach people to be surgeons, still teach them how to operate but also give them these tools to do it, you know, in this minimally invasive sort of fashion. And so it's 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 a bigger question. How what do we this is here and it's gonna be here and it's gonna grow. And when that new version of the hub comes out and you get your monthly report of you know and it's telling you what you should do to be more efficient with the robot, it's gonna change drastically change our surgery. And so how do we train our trainees to be surgeons, not just robotic surgeons? Just a quick comment. Yeah, you're right. Um, 20 years ago, when I first did in 2003, there was nothing. I went to a weekend course, went and watched the surgeon, and then I did no problem. Power risk and memory is not a complicated procedure. But now, when two of my junior partners wanted to start, they had to not only go to the course, practice, and also get an extra product. I think industry is changing. They are, you know, they don't want this to fail. Right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to stick. Sorry. We're going to stick uh, with robotics, and uh, the next talk is by <clears throat> Jonathan Cullen. He goes by Mike. He's our current fellow in Colorado, but went to medical school at UT San Antonio, and is going to be joining the faculty here in just a couple of months. Um, he's been under the uh, tutelage of Dr. Shaq and Knight in robotics, and his talk is Robotics and Transplant Fellowship Training. See one, do one, teach one. So, Mike, we look forward to your talk. 
thank you, Dr. Keneally. Uh, it's an honor to be here today, and you know, like Dr. Keneally was saying, um, this is uh, uh, got family in South Texas. I grew up in Fort Worth. I went to medical school in San Antonio, and I'm really excited to be <clears throat> starting my first job um, here in San Antonio and joining Dr. Fritchie back there. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk actually was just discussed in uh, the last talk's kind of discussion, but I was going to briefly touch on fellowship training and how are we training people to do robotics uh, in transplantation surgery. Um, disclosures, I have received uh, compensation uh, for consulting from Intuitive, but I, I don't have any disclosures that are relevant to this talk. Um, so <clears throat> there's really not a defined surgical resident or fellowship training paradigm uh, for the robot. My uh, robot certification was I had to do X amount of procedures at bedside, X amount of procedures which I had to do uh, greater than 50% of, had to get my program director from residency sign off on it, and it's all um, uh, just proprietary to intuitive. It, it's not really us um, setting up a training pathway, it's uh, from intuitive. But you have to complete your, your modules as well, uh, but it's all set and defined by uh, the company that makes the robot. Um, and now, <clears throat> as um, Dr. Pashak talked about, there's just an explosion of robotic surgery and there's nothing that we're gonna be able to do to put that gene back in the bottle. It's, it's, it's going to, uh, uh, it's really gonna be the future and you can just see it with the um, kind of how, how accelerated the Da Vinci technology became where in 1999, uh, the first robot, there were just three arms. There was a camera and then two operating arms, and it was only in the mid-2000s that they added a fourth arm. And uh, I was trained on the SI as well as the XI in residency, and uh, just in a matter of 15 years, um, all the kind of bells and whistles that Intuitive added to the XI uh, platform, um, it's really unbelievable. So it's, it's definitely gonna become um, a huge part of our practice is transplant surgeons, but how do we incorporate it and figure out how to train our fellows? So um, in uh, transplant surgery, we don't do a ton of operations, um, but um, uh, with the robot, uh, there's robotic donor nephrectomy, robotic kidney transplant, the donor hepatectomy, um, robotic pancreas transplant has also been talked about. Uh, but those are kind of the four core um, robotic uh, cases in transplant. And uh, just a brief history uh, with the laparoscopic donor nephrectomy. When it was first published in 1995 by Dr. Ratner, it was very controversial. Uh, when I was at ASTS uh, in January, uh, there were people talking about the forums and the discussions that they had and the arguments over laparoscopic versus open. And I'm sure that there are some open nephrectomies that are done today in the United States but uh, that's kind of crazy to me because I've only seen it done laparoscopically or robotically, uh, that that operation will be done open um, when you have a minimally invasive option. Uh, it's kind of, <clears throat> that just seems rather archaic. And uh, over time, laparoscopic donor nephrectomy was proven to have fewer complications, much more patient satisfaction, uh, as well as the equal safety profile and then your graft function just as fine compared with the open technique. Um, and so a lot of the <clears throat> early research over, you know, when is a person certified on a laparoscopic donor nephrectomy was done with looking at the learning curve, looking at how long it took for proficiency, um, and it led to kind of some guidelines being um, uh, set. Now the ASTS requires 12 laparoscopic nephrectomy cases for certification, and UNOS recommends 15 for fellow proficiency. but. Um, with the robot donor nephrectomy, now this first happened in 2002, and, and like we talked about, I mean, it's rapidly uh, being adopted. I uh, uh, saw it in uh, residency. It was standard of care at the University of Virginia where I did my residency to do a, a, a donor nephrectomy robotically. Um, and uh, it's got a better morbidity profile with identical outcomes to the laparoscopic. It's more ergonomic, you have better visualization. Uh, but, you know, just kind of, where does it fit in between open, lap, and how do you determine proficiency? Um, and I kind of show this because of the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. The good is that it's equivalent to laparoscopic and it's got a great morbidity profile, but 
hospitals are hesitant to uh, give robot time and robot days uh, because you can see here that the cases are much longer and the costs are much higher. Um, so that's kind of the bad and the ugly of it. But without a doubt, it outperforms the quality of life, narcotic uses, uh, patient satisfaction, but really how is proficiency established? And the answer is the technology. Uh, the My Intuitive app, we know what uh, proficiency, when surgeons gain proficiency. Um, the uh, Washington University in St. Louis just published a paper, and they probably have the best or the most formalized defined curriculum for uh, uh, fellowship education or robotic donor nephrectomy. They have prerequisites, online didactic training, dry labs, you've got to do 10 cases minimum bedside assist. Uh, but in a paper, they showed that the like the, uh, uh, the operative independence time was about a year and the number of cases were about 15 um, to get there. And, and these are the graphs from their paper, which shows over time uh, more operative independence. Now, I think if you did 15 cases in a month, you would probably get there. It wouldn't take a year. Um, <clears throat> but once again, uh, going up against the hospital and how often they'll allocate robotic time can be a challenge. Um, and then the handoff percent and the active control time, and all this is monitored in the My Intuitive app and collected by the XI platform that you could see early on there were fewer handovers from the fellow to the attending because the attending would just take over the case. And then as the fellow became more and more proficient, there were more handoffs as there was kind of a give and a go. And then at the end, um, or as time goes on, uh, fewer handoffs because the fellow is able to um, take over and do the entirety of the case. Um, so these data match up very similarly to the laparoscopic donor nephrectomy recommendations put out by UNOS and ASTS. Um, so I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about proficiency for robotic kidney transplant, which is, uh, Tom, uh, Dr. Pashak makes it look easy, but it is an exceptionally challenging and difficult operation, one of the hardest ones that I've really been a part of, especially in these very large and obese patients. Um, this is the UIC data that was just published in um, AJT, and uh, you can see in the second row, it's kind of small print, I apologize, but the warm ischemia times, so you have to sew the graft in robotically, and it is in the abdomen, it's exposed to ambient heat from the light of the of the um, camera, you have the heat of the patients uh, intracorporeally, and you can see this range of warm ischemia time, 20 minutes all the way to 122 minutes in the very large BMI. So that's two hours of warm ischemia time. What is kind of the learning curve and the proficiency uh, of a robotic kidney transplant? And a lot of that data, uh, because they do so many of them in Europe, and it's become kind of the standard there, that it's a ton of cases, it's 35 cases, according to the European Robotic Urologic Society, um, to achieve reproducibility in terms of complications, timing, and, and outcomes. Um, so it's a very steep uh, learning curve, and, and it could take you know a, a year, if not more, to reach that 35 cases uh, of that. <clears throat> so uh, just to talk a little bit about my University of Colorado experience, um, it's been somewhat of a challenge because when I first showed up, nobody except Tom and Trevor were interested in the robot, so I got to do it because I had interest, and now more and more attendings are looking to do it. <clears throat> so I've had to kind of fight with some of the other attendings as the years have gone on. Um, but we really incorporate, <coughs> excuse me, um, parallel learning in each case where I will do certain parts of it um, and then pass it over to Trevor, and so you can become proficient at individual tasks, kind of shared learning, shared pace, um, but uh, it ultimately leads to gradual advancement of me and my training. And where we've really been, uh, uh, where I've been very fortunate is we have this robotic auto transplant program, which Dr. Pashak has talked about at this meeting in the past. Um, the auto transplant is indicated for loin pain, hematuria syndrome, pelvic congestion syndrome, nutcracker, and this is an old slide. <clears throat> We've actually done 39 of the robotic assisted auto transplants, but it's been crucial for all of our faculty and for my fellowship training to learn how to do these robotic nephrectomy and the robotic transplant. 
uh, because it gets both of those operations in one. We do the robotic nephrectomy on the, on the patient, we take it out, we flush it, and then we put it back in, and then we sew it in robotically. Um, so that has allowed for that parallel learning where I will do the nephrectomy, and then Tom will expose the vessels, and then Trevor will sew it in, and we'll switch. And uh, being on the robot for a number of hours like that is absolutely exhausting. So it actually helps to break up the case with our, uh, you know, concentration um, individually. I, I feel. And uh, this is one of our. This is us getting ready to do the implant of our auto transplant. And uh, we do the nephrectomy through four uh, port sites. We close the top one after we're done with the nephrectomy. Uh, reposition the patient <clears throat> and then we'll add another trocar over right lateral um, and then eventually externalize the drain so through all these incisions we have done a robotic nephrectomy and then a robotic transplant all in the same case all in the same day and um, that really has allowed us to move forward in doing our robotic kidney transplants because these autos are, are not actual transplants, they're not as scrutinized, the stakes are not quite as high. Um, we have lost one graft doing the 39 auto transplants, but the stakes are just not quite as high, so we feel that we have confidence when we go into doing live donors and deceased donors with robotic kidney transplants. And then I'm, I'm gonna say robotic liver transplant, um, it's, probably going to come. Dr. Uh, Professor Boring in uh, Saudi Arabia has actually done a robotic total hepatectomy, taken the liver out, split it, put it back in, and sewed it in robotically on a cadaver. Um, I don't think that that's probably going to be really generalizable and reproducible, uh, probably in the American system. Uh, but it just goes to show that people are pushing these boundaries and as the technology improves, this isn't going anywhere. This is going to have to be something that we're you know, going to have to teach fellows and, and it will be the future. Um, so in conclusion and recommendations, um, to touch on what everybody has said, I think the ASTS um, and UNOS needs to uh, establish minimum case requirements for fellowship, uh, fellow proficiency and certification upon graduation for robotic nephrectomy. They've kind of been slow with uh, establishing those numbers. And I think that they should be the same as what the laparoscopic numbers are, uh, because as time's gonna go on, more and more residents coming into fellowships uh, are gonna have as much robotic experience as they have laparoscopic experience, if not more. So their ability to get on the console and do these cases, it's going to be second nature to them as you know, all of our residencies and fellowships advance. And ultimately, like uh, Dr. Bashak said, as more and more people are gonna start doing this and taking this up, um, if a robotic donor hepatectomy does not go well, that's gonna shut, that's gonna cause so many problems. And, and I think the ASTS is gonna need to be proactive in either establishing a robotic subcommittee or a robotic committee to um, really kind of oversee outcomes, training, proficiency, um, and who's doing what, and allowing everybody to work together to avoid that, because that could kind of be a, a little bit of a nail in the coffin situation for these procedures at, at different institutions. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all for listening, and uh, um, it's my honor to address the college. Really thoughtful, and I think it really dovetails obviously nicely with what Tom was doing. Are there any further? We had a lot of the discussion. I know. Before you got up there. But uh, are there any other comments? We are a little bit behind, a lot behind time, but um, maybe we can take this offline and we can move on to the next. But it's my great job. And welcome, San Antonio. You're in your home. Okay, I think we'll take up time. You're going to change views and uh, yeah, the next key topic of pancreas transplant. Our next presenter is uh, Sarah Papa. Sarah Papa is a medical student at the SUNY Upstate in the same in New York. And she will talk, us, talk to us about pancreas transplant and don't use us. Where are we standing after two years?
thank you for the introduction and thank you to Dr. Saidi for inviting me to speak today. And I also want to recognize my co-authors who contributed very much to the work. So I'm going to be talking again about pancreas transplantation in the USA, where are we standing after 20 years. I have a couple sources of funding to apply for this project. I just want to start out by talking about some general trends of pancreas transplantation. So for a quick history lesson, the first pancreas transplant was performed in 1966, and obviously the field has changed tremendously since then. So currently what we're seeing is that there's a trend for decreasing numbers of pancreas transplants being performed, and that's all types of pancreas transplant. And they peaked in about 2008. And in 2020, we saw that there was 962 pancreas transplants performed, and that was down from 1,015 performed in 2019. If we look at the different types of pancreas transplant, we can see that the vast majority being performed are the simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant. In contrast, the pancreas transplant alone, or the PTA, makes up a much smaller number. And again, we're seeing trends for decreasing numbers of the PTA being performed again since the peak in about 2008. And there were only 87 PTAs performed in 2020. And so some of the reasons that we might be seeing this decrease in pancreas transplants and a PTA is that there's been a lot of advancements made in insulin therapy and there are some concerns regarding outcomes following the PTA. I also want to quickly touch on the indications for pancreas transplant alone in the treatment of diabetes. So PTA is typically reserved for those patients that have a history of frequent and severe metabolic arrangements including hypo or hyperglycemia and PTA that requires frequent medical treatment. It's also um, reserved for those patients that have debilitating clinical or emotional aversion to exogenous insulin therapy, or those with a failure of insulin therapy to prevent the sequelae of diabetes. There have been many previous retrospective and registry analyses that have shown a wide range of graft and tissue survivals at 1, 5, 10, and 20 years post-transplant. So what we wanted to do was to quantify outcomes following PTA in the United States from 2000 to 2020, emphasizing graft and patient survival, and to compare trends for each of the 10-year of the ten -year periods within this time frame. So we performed a retrospective registry analysis of the OPTM UNOS database for PTA performed in the United States from January 2000 to May 2020. We included those patients that received their PTA between 2000 and 2020 that had available allograft and patient survival data. We excluded anybody that had a multi-organ transplant, a simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant, or a pancreas after kidney transplant. We separated those included patients into two subgroups, those who received their PTA between 2000 and 2009, and those who received their PTA between 2010 and 2020. Primarily, we wanted to assess allograft and patient survival rates in different time frames over the past 20 years. So if we look at our general demographic data, we can see that throughout the study period, there was 3,060 PTAs that were performed. 1,679 of these were performed from January 2000 through December 2009, and 1,381 were performed from January 2010 through May 2020. If we compare the two cohorts, we can see that BMI was increased in the later cohort, and the biggest increase came from the patients that had an overweight BMI. We also saw that the pancreas preservation time decreased significantly, and that there was a, more PTA recipients that had a higher chance of an HLA mismatch that were received in transplant. And finally, the mean length of hospital stay actually increased in the later cohort at 32.38 days compared to 25.83 days in the earlier cohort. If we look at our allograft survival, we can see that we maintained high survival at near 80% at one year post-transplant, and then 50% survival at five years post-transplant over the entire study period. But we did see, importantly, that graft survival improved significantly in the later cohort versus in the earlier cohort. When we broke down graft survival by different types of diabetes, we can see that for type 1 diabetes, there was increasing graft survival from the earlier cohort to a later cohort at every time period with the exception of 10 year survival. And this did remain steady from the earlier to the later cohort. The slightly lower survival at our 10 year period is somewhat expected because the half life of a pancreas transplant has been estimated to be between 7 to 14 years. Moving on to look at type 2 diabetes, we can see that there was increasing survival from the earlier to the later cohort at every time point, and they saw a big jump in their 10-year survival. Overall, though, outcomes are better for type 1 diabetes versus type 2 diabetes. We also calculated some hazard ratios for potential factors affecting graft survival. It's important to note that these associations were pretty small and they were inconsistent between the cohorts. But what we did find was that recipient male sex was associated with an increased allograft survival for our early cohort. Recipient white ethnicity was associated with decreased survival only for the later cohort. 
Increasing donor age was associated with decreased allograft survival only in the later cohort, and donor male sex was associated with decreased allograft survival in the earlier cohort. We further looked at how postoperative complications can affect long-term allograft survival. The only postoperative complication that was found to actually affect allograft survival in the long term was postoperative pancreatitis, and it was shown to have an effect of decreased graft survival in the long term for all points in the study period. We further wanted to characterize different causes of graft failure. And we can see that all causes of graft failure have decreased significantly from the early to the later cohort, and there's a significant reduction in surgical complications as surgeon experience increased. There was also a very significant decrease in chronic allograft projection, which decreased about 2.9 fold, and a clinically significant decrease in pancreatitis, which decreased about three fold. And this is very important due to its effect on long term allograft survival. Moving on to talk about patient survival. Again, looking at our survival curve, we can see that we maintain very high patient survival. At one year, we were over 90% with our patient survival, and at five years, we were at 70% for our patient survival, and this was for the entire 20 year period. But we can see for patient survival that it was very similar in both cohorts. Again, we broke this down by type of diabetes. So for type one, we can see we maintain very high survival rates at all time points. The slight decrease that we saw for the 10 year survival in the linear cohort may be related to the decrease in graft survival that we were talking about earlier, because if they were less likely to have graft survival at this time point, they may have been more likely to have diabetes related complications, and so this could have had an effect on their survival. For type 2 diabetes, we saw an increase in five year survival from the earlier to the later cohort, but 10 year survival we saw stay steady. And once again, outcomes for type 1 diabetes seem to be better than those for type 2 diabetes. So we can integrate what we learned from our study with what has already been discovered for PTA. So if we look at PTA versus insulin therapy, one study has shown that from 1995 to 2003, four-year patient survival rates were higher in PTA recipients versus those who were still on the wait list. And the mortality hazard ratio favored transplant over standard of care beyond one year post-transplant. A second study showed that in the 25-year period between 1987 and 2012, PTA saved 14,903 life years, or about 2.4 life years per, per recipient compared to patients who are on the wait list. Finally, another study showed that PTA and associated immune suppression is less costly compared to standard of care with insulin therapy over a 10-year period, and that it provides more quality adjusted life years compared to standard of care over a 10-year period. There's also been significant research into factors affecting PTA outcomes. Those who've looked at donor factors have found that there's an increased risk of graft failure with donor age greater than 50, terminal donor creatinine greater than 2.5, donor BMI greater than or equal to 30, prolonged cholestemia time, donor insulin use, or PTA being performed for a low volume transplant center. However, a recent world consensus conference on pancreas transplant found no compelling evidence to recommend against the use of donors greater than 40 years old, pediatric donors, or donors with a BMI greater than or equal to 30. However, they did find that ideal pancreas preservation times for optimal outcomes was less than 12 hours. So pancreas preservation times up to 24 hours are still acceptable. And the importance of reducing preservation times to improve outcomes is reflected in the decreased preservation times seen over time in our study. Finally, some studies have shown that graft and patient survival are not affected by donor status as donation after cardiac death versus donation after brain death. So there is some increased risk of thrombosis in the graft. Other studies have looked at recipient factors that affect PTA outcomes. So it's known that early technical failure is typically caused by thrombosis, pancreatitis, leaks, infections, and bleeding. Of the early complications following transplant, our study now shows that only pancreatitis affects the long-term survival of the graft. Other risk factors for early graft failure include African-American recipients, younger recipients because of their stronger immune system, recipients who are CMV positive, and female recipients. Studies have shown a decreased risk of technical failure with bladder drains of exocrine secretions and the use of tacrolimus for immunosuppression. Other complications that lead to decreased patient survival are diabetic nephropathy and immunosuppression that lead to renal failure and coronary events following transplant. However, renal failure following transplant is much less common if the pre-transplant EGFR was greater than 60. We also know that appropriate immunosuppression is very important following transplant to protect against graft failure. 
Studies have shown that an episode of rejection within the first year post-transplant is associated with decreased graft survival at five years post-transplant. It's been shown that tacrolimus-based immunosuppression is superior to cyclosporin-based immunosuppression, and that combining it with mycophenolic mofacil is superior to this combination with azabriotrin. Furthermore, rejection risk is lower if you use depleting antibodies for induction. However, early withdrawal of steroids from the main use regimen does not seem to affect graft survival outcomes and may actually improve metabolic outcomes. All of these advancements in our immune suppressive regimens have likely led to the decreases in allergy graft rejection and the improvements in graft survival rate that we're seeing over time. And they've also likely led to the greater amounts of having patients receive a transplant when they have a higher chance of an HLA mismatch, as we saw in our study. Finally, I want to talk about some improvements in diabetes-related outcomes and quality of life following PTA. <coughs> Studies have shown that patients who receive a PTA have improved signs and symptoms of di diabetic neuropathy. This includes motor sensory and to a lesser extent autonomic neuropathy. They also have stabilization or improvement in retinopathy, and they have improved glycemic control of both hypo and hyperglycemia and have a lower A1C. Finally, they have improved self-reported health scores and quality of life. All of these decreases in diabetes-related complications likely lead to the high survival rates that we're seeing following PTA. There were some limitations to our current study. As with any retrospective study, we cannot control for any confounding variables, which could introduce the risk of selection bias. There was some missing data within the database, which led us to exclude some patients. And so this could have altered the graph of patient survival rates or mass and differences between our groups. Finally, there hasn't actually been a uniform definition for graft failure and pancreas transplant until very recently. And so there may have been differences in definition of graft failure among transplant centers that could have led to differences in outcome reporting that affected the calculated graft survival rates. Conclusions we made from our study was that PPA has favorable outcomes in terms of both graft and patient survival. There's been progress over the years in terms of surgical technique, organ allocation and preservation, and immune suppressive regimens that has led to improved outcomes following PTA. And PTA is a considerable option for the treatment of diabetes. This is specifically true for type 1 diabetes. It's still a little bit questionable for type 2 diabetes because there have only been a small number of patients with type 2 that have received a transplant, and so we haven't been able to fully evaluate these outcomes. Finally, to fully summarize the state of pancreas transplantation alone in the USA in the last 20 years, despite growing numbers of people living with diabetes, the number of PTA transplants performed each year has been decreasing. Our study shows excellent one in five year graft and patient survival rates among PTA recipients, including those with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Advancements in transplant medicine are leading to continuous improvements in these survival rates, and PTA shows both a survival and cost benefit compared to unscheduled therapy. Based on this data, we believe PTA should be considered for more patients with diabetes who meet criteria. Thank you for your time. Is there any questions? Thank you, Sarah, for such a great presentation. I think it takes a lot of blood for a medical student to come to a surgical meeting and present such a controversial topic. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to move to the next, next presentation is about pancreas transplantation, and then we have more time for questions. Our next presenter is Dr. Matt Cooper, who is currently Chief of the Division of Transplant at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and he's going to talk to us about ensuring the future of diabetes of care in the U.S. future for pancreas transplantation. folks are anxious to go out and support the local economy in San Antonio from Cinco de Mayo, so I'll try and be brief about this. <clears throat> well, thank the organizers for the opportunity. Uh, appreciate being here. Uh, this is uh, my second year attending the meeting. I think one of the most uh, incredible opportunities is to have conversations uh, between the meetings and, and so between the sessions and have conversation around what we all recognize as opportunities and problems and things to learn from one another, one another. So I'm really pleased to hopefully present a topic which is of interest to folks by a show of hands. Has anybody ever taken care of someone with diabetes? Of course you have, right? Diabetes is such a prominent problem in the United States. And I'm here to talk, to build on Sarah's presentation, which was outstanding. I'm gonna show you hopefully some 
pretty pictures and a call to action about why I think we are at a big crossroad right now when it comes to pancreas transplantation. Um, a couple of disclosures. I do participate, I'm an ex officio member for the IP organization. That's the national organization supporting pancreas and island cell transplantation. If anybody is at all interested, I think it's an outstanding organization to share ideas and to be able to um, pull resources. So, uh, I don't need to tell you this, diabetes is an epidemic worldwide. The numbers are absolutely astonishing. The number that's not up there that I think is really concerning and somewhat impressive to me, despite 21st century technology, is that one in five Americans do not even know they have diabetes, which you think about that as being you know, counterintuitive to hopefully where medicine is in the U.S., but it in fact is very true. The suppression of, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, I think that means diabetes. Because when you look at the morbidity associated with diabetes, certainly we know about the mortality, but all of the complications that we deal with on a regular basis, whether that's transplant, general surgery, vascular surgery, bariatric surgery, is absolutely incredible. Yeah, what's equally, I think, important to recognize is that it's become more and more of an epidemic in uh, Hispanics and African Americans. And I recently changed positions. Previously, I worked in Washington, D.C., and it was absolutely an epidemic. And some of the data that I'll refer to is in relation to that population. <clears throat> I want you to burn this memory into your head. I don't know if folks have heard of the uh, expression bionic pancreas. <clears throat> For those of us that grew up in the 80s and loved Steve Austin and the bionic man, I hate the term bionic pancreas. For controlled glucose monitoring and intermittent insulin therapy, even by pumps, I'm here to tell you that that does not uh, equate to the results that we find in pancreas transplantation. So this is uh, the so-called dead in bed syndrome. I hope not to offend anybody, but it is a recognized syndrome associated with hypoglycemic unawareness for those that are even treated with that quote bionic pancreas. So folks have uh, uh, variable insulin levels. Um, down here you can see when they have boluses to correct uh, uh, hyperglycemia that unfortunately at some point during the evening of this individual uh, resulted in significant hypoglycemia with hypoglycemic unawareness. There was too late a response to this outstanding bionic pancreas that unfortunately resulted in this patient's death. And whoever out there, whoever in the medical community might say, well, this doesn't happen anymore. I'm here to tell you that it's absolutely untrue. This happens every day in the United States of America with the most outstanding technology that you can imagine. Now, the thing that I, I find quite interesting is I think that we try and overthink uh, the diagnosis and the severity of diabetes. Let's just face the fact that diabetes is bad. Rather than, if you look at some of these really complex formulae that are necessary in order to determine, does someone have mild diabetes or they have moderate diabetes, do that diabetes is diabetes is diabetes, and it's all bad in my sort of humble perspective. And I think hopefully at the end of this conversation you'll find that we have to become, I think, more aware of the fact that diabetes kills our patients on a regular basis and not worry so much about is this mild, moderate, severe, or even if it's type one or type two diabetes. Um, the, the, the amount of data that uh, over the course of really uh, decades has demonstrated the result of hypoglycemic unawareness really demonstrates that it's actually very significant. I'm gonna to refer to this study a couple times. Uh, the UK where 46% of uh, patients in their observational study had symptoms and had uh, data that was significant with hypoglycemic unawareness, <clears throat> which again, I think calls the fact that this is a really significant problem. And the fact that, uh, again, for folks that have hypoglycemic unawareness, regardless of what their quote, overall control is, the incidence of events relating to things like seizures and loss of consciousness occurs across the spectrum. And for patients that are unaware of the fact that, again, the un unawareness of their low blood sugars, the results and the complications are 20-fold compared to those that perhaps have some awareness of when their sugars are dropping. This is a very simple slide, but let's remember the fact of why we're here. Diabetes going unchecked with increasing hemoglobin A1Cs leads to the complications of neuropathy, the reasons why folks need kidney transplants, the reasons why people need multiple eye operations because they've lost their eyesight. It is a very, very debilitating disease. And again, raising your hand and care for one of those diabetics, I'm sure everyone has had their hand literally, probably, in someone who they've had to take care of a complication related to diabetes. And it gets worse with exposure, the longer the time that folks have uh, diabetes, again, compared to uh, a, a, a very intensive group of folks that were treated for their diabetes, again, the incidence of hypoglycemia is still something which we have to take very seriously. And so this doesn't, quote, get better, or patients get more aware of the complications associated with their diabetes, it just continues to get worse. So this is from a medical journal. 
<clears throat> and I apologize. I get a little heated when I come to this operation. So folks in the front row, I promise not to throw anything down. But I think what's important to show is when we have to think about all of these sort of levels of potential therapy for folks that have true diabetes, so uncontrolled hemoglobin A1Cs or inability to control their diabetes for some of these medical methods, the medical literature talks about going from first, second, third, and fourth line every three to six months until potentially patients are better. Now let's remember that first slide I showed you. The patient unfortunately was dead in bed. That took one day for that to happen. And now we're talking to have to get all the way down here to fourth line therapy before we even begin to talk about pancreas or island cell transplants. This to me is a problem, and perhaps the reason why our endocrinologists and why our medical professionals do not seem to refer these patients to us for, for pancreas transplantation, much like our, my previous speaker spoke of. And it's even more fantastic when you think that patients come to us with end-stage renal disease secondary to diabetes that they actually aren't referred for a combination kidney and pancreas transplant because there still is a lack of appreciation of the value of pancreas transplantation. So the question is, well then let's study that. Let's put a, a randomized controlled trial together looking at optimized exogenous insulin versus isolated pancreas transplant. What's the result? What's the data for that? Well, that's never happened, right? It'd be very difficult to think about creating that trial of consenting patients and putting them you know, through both of those types of therapies. And so we don't really have that data to rely on. There's a lot of sort of help aids out there that kind of look at the pros and the cons of pancreas transplant, islet cell transplant, which I would love to talk more about. But unfortunately, the United States insurance doesn't pay for islet cell transplant because it's still looked upon as experimental therapy. Although there's really outstanding data and results in Europe, and I hope one day we get to the point of actually implementing more therapies utilizing islet cells. When we look at comparisons of, again, here's my favorite friend, the bionic pancreas, looking at the pros and the cons, recognizing that this is recognized as an alternative to insulin, bionic pancreas is not a biological cure. What I think is the important piece that we have to be honest with ourselves, not everybody is a candidate for pancreas transplant, not everybody is a candidate for an operation. And we have to be very cautious in the selection of the appropriate patients for a lot of the things we talked about before. If we start having horrific complications, lots of graft losses of patients' deaths, Unfortunately, the, the, the pancreas transplant field is going to die with it. So, it, this is you know a hyperbole for certain. This is an example of an excellent uh, pancreas transplant alone candidate described by my previous speaker. But I think they're youngish. My definition of old changes with every birthday. day. Uh, they're symptomatic. They've probably failed medical therapy, and they're otherwise low risk. That's actually the majority of people in the United States now. Um, youngish may be a little bit sort of up for debate, but the reality is that when you look at the definition of failed medical therapy, many patients have gone on to at least a secondary or third line uh, medical intervention to treat their diabetes. We put together a paper a couple years ago and sort of looking at the indications and contraindications. And I, I think when you look at this um, you know, pretty objectively, you recognize that this is a pretty extreme patient, that there is the you know, more, I think, people that fall into the category of a potential candidate for pancreas transplant versus those that do not. And again, I don't think we would get too much argument from members in the community, including those in transplant, that those would be absolute contraindications. Earlier, we talked about standing on the shoulders of giants of this organization. The same can be said for pancreas transplantation. University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin, <clears throat> we call that the other transplant program in the state of Wisconsin from the medical college. And then Northwestern, just outstanding data, really of enormous series of patients that have done extraordinarily well. From a surgical standpoint, <clears throat> the pancreas transplant operation, although technically demanding, it's incredibly rewarding. The, oper the, the picture here shows the, the actual drainage of the, uh, the extricate portion of the gland into the bladder. It can be done into the GI tract, and I'll show you some pictures of that later. But what I hope to be able to show you is that we've demonstrated some significant improvements over time, which have really changed, I think, the entire complexion of the operation and hopefully, again, become more and more motivating to our field. What's concerning to me as I show you some of the data is that fewer and fewer transplant programs are doing the operation, fewer and fewer fellows are getting trained in the operation, and we're beginning to sort of lose the appreciation of the value of the operation over well, so overall. So, in general, I hope what I can at least demonstrate for a pancreas transplant alone is that it again demonstrates significant improvements in quality of life, significant uh, deviations from, I think, the timeline for, for diabetes that goes unchecked. And there is, I think, very good data that actually may prolong the lifespan of our patients. Somewhat older data, but I think it's impressive 
that if we can actually get to someone earlier in the course of their diabetes, we can actually prevent them from actually going on to developing diabetes. One of the contraindications that I was talked about earlier is sometimes folks get too far into the course of their end-stage diabetic illness that we can't transplant the pancreas alone because their kidney function is already too bad. And then we institute immunosuppression and we put them in kidney failure. Kidney after pancreas transplant is not something we recognize in the community, so we try to avoid that altogether. But again, if you look at you know, the results of the uh, glucose before and after pancreas transplantation, where we have all these sort of peaks and valleys, a successful pancreas transplantation restores the euglycemia of a normal pancreas. It really changes overall the quality uh, and length of life. Now, I'm a simple surgeon. This is a pretty easy graph to follow. The success of 44 pancreas transplants, this is data from the University of Wisconsin, that really shows that the follow-up and the, the, uh, the success of that operation really is a measure. And if you look at also the hemoglobin A1Cs of a similar population, this is long-term outstanding diabetic control. And if you compare that to that, uh, that UK study that I showed you before, it still is in my mind an apples and oranges comparison to the success of restoring someone's uh, normal glycemia, their hemoglobin A1C, their overall quality and length of life. This is what continues to shock me. We, talk, we, sh we showed this in numbers, but I think it's even easier to follow when you see the significant drop in pancreas transplantation despite all that outstanding data. And I think many of us scrapped our head as to why that is. If you look at the numbers of transplant centers, these are the number of transplants again, but you look at the number of transplant centers, there's roughly about 250 kidney transplant programs in the United States. But you look at the numbers of pancreas transplant programs, that's half of the, of the centers. But if you look more, Deeply into the data, you'll find out that 44, 44 programs do 75% of the kidney transplants. I'm oh, sorry, the pancreas transplants. Do you know how many pancreas transplants you need to do in the U.S. to maintain your candidacy in the, in, in the UNOS? Two. If you do two pancreas transplants, you can continue to call yourself a pancreas transplant program. And I think there's probably many talks during this conference and others that say, you're doing a significant number of these complex cases, much like our robotic colleague earlier, so that really allows not only the successful completion of the operation, but also the training of your, your fellows and also of your ICUs and your, and your nurses on the floor. <clears throat> but again, if you look at the outcomes for the data, compared to a living donor kidney transplant, it's actually pretty darn close to that. And yet I cannot recognize these are carefully chosen patients as I showed before. But to not appreciate the outcomes and the success of this operation, I think we're really missing things. This is outstanding data that's collected by the International Pancreas Transplant Registry. So we're such a small group, there's such few transplants being done. We can actually follow the data pretty carefully. If you look at for a sequential period, you can see that this is one of the most impressive uh, improvements in operations, operative technique, and care of patients that I've seen, at least in my business. And that's not only a patient survival, but if you look at pancreas transplant survival, I mean, when we first started this operation, the comment about the graft thromboses and pancreatitis, um, we've really gotten so much better at this to the point where, you know, comparing again the apples and oranges is a, another interesting conversation. So this, in my mind, I think sort of encompasses what I just talked about for uh, type one uh, patients with hypoglycemic unawareness. I, I agree, I'm not sure we're quite there for type two diabetics, but again, I think there's a lot of really opportunities um, that we can really, I think, uh, uh, capitalize on with pancreas transplantation. So a few quick sides <clears throat> about SPK. Again, technically very rewarding operation. You perform both a kidney transplant and a pancreas transplant in the same recipient. You have them both off dialysis and no longer needing endogenous insulin therapy. Amazing changes of life in those patients. Those are the patients that are raising their hand and go out to be the, the spokesperson for your transplant program. If you look at, again, the patient survival, you know, over the course of those uh, increasing decades, you can see we've again made significant improvements in the SBK patient survival. The same thing with the pancreas survival, and the same thing with the kidney uh, survival. Uh, again, uh, I think it's a really remarkable demonstration of improvements in our techniques and our care of patients. And again, when you look at those early pancreas transplant failures, the three various operations that we could do, I mean, that again, to me, is a remarkable, um, uh, I think showing of how we can continue to do an operation better and how we can choose patients and graph better too uh, shows just a different way. But what I think it's important to recognize is that 40% of our patient waiting list is made up of diabetics. Um, and, but for every uh, 10,000 patients who have type one diabetes, only three of those is gonna be offered to receive a pancreas transplant. For type two diabetes, you know, that's only three in a million. 
But what's important to recognize is that type 2 diabetes has increased significantly you know, on our waiting list because now that's allowed, pancreas transplantation for type 2. And if you live again in the, in the, uh, the urban environment that I lived in, you have to appreciate that SPK now has increased dramatically in our African American population. I'm going to skip this except to say, I think we have to stop, as I talked about, making diabetes too complicated. We also have to stop thinking too much about, well, is this a type 1 or is this a type 2 diabetic? Because the data is going to clearly show that regardless of type 1 or type 2 diabetes, which is often defined as uh, based upon age and weight and whether or not there's evidence of anti-insulin um, uh, antibodies, uh, in reality does not seem to differentiate the outcomes between one versus the other, and I'll show you why. So one of our, um, my predecessors in Washington, D.C., Dr. Jimmy Light, looked at a 20-year experience and when reviewing his data, you know, found out that in retrospect, when utilizing C-peptide as what we standardly use in diagnosing type 1 and type 2 diabetes, a lot of patients were misdiagnosed. And when you went back and sort of diagnosed them properly, you found out that there really was no differentiating the type 1 and the type 2s. You know, another sort of pioneer in our field, Dr. Bob Strat from Wake Forest, his conclusion when he looked at all of his data was that really the single most important aspect was really ensuring that we chose the right recipients. Um, I'm going to skip over this in, in the interest of time. But what again is, is the important piece to appreciate is that you know, more and more of our type 2 diabetics are African Americans and our Hispanics. And again, the, re the data showing that the outcomes for type 2 diabetics also means that we have to consider for these populations that this operation works and should be afforded to them as well. And, and sadly, in the U.S., we're not doing enough of that. When you look at, again, you know, the, the type 2 diabetic, diabetics, it is primarily in SPKs and also in PAKs. And so one of the big operations that we're now seeing more and more of is patients who come in as those uremic diabetics. They're receiving a living donor kidney transplant and then a pancreas after kidney in order to take care of their diabetes and protect their, their organ. So as you see, the, the percentage of population is increasing. Uh, for SPK that are type 2 diabetics, which I think is a, an, an exciting thing. The survival continues to be outstanding for those recipients. Um, some have argued that, well, if you're going to think about now putting a kidney and a pancreas and you're going to utilize both iliac arteries and veins on both sides, what about if they need a repeat kidney transplant? Well, there's actually a lot of really good data. We do all of our transplants ipsilaterally, so both the kidney and the pancreas are on the same side. If they need a repeat transplant, it's easier to go back. Akin to the conversation we had earlier, folks are now doing robotic pancreas transplantation. I need you young guys to figure this operation out. That can't be easy to do, but I think it's pretty exciting. We're doing repeat pancreas transplantations, even repeat SPK transplants, which again is a technically rewarding, demanding, but technically rewarding operation. And so again, in my mind, I think there's really uh, some outstanding data that demonstrates even for type two recipients that, uh, that kidney and pancreas transplant is a successful operation. Uh, I'm going to finish with this slide that says we do have to be careful, however, because there is an appreciation that for patients that have too large of a BMI and too much insulin, that we can only ask so much out of our pancreas transplants. The result that the um, the results, the events of leading to post-transplant diabetes, you know, in those groups, whether you're type one or type two, continues to be, I think, a problem. And so this one again, I think, is the optimal type two pancreas a patient. Of course, they have to be insulin dependent. We can perform either operations. They have to have a reasonably low insulin requirement. We usually use one unit per kilogram per day. We have to choose the patients well, avoiding morbidly obese patients and those that have you know, only mild to moderate comorbidities. Visualization means something. So again, my fear is that we are doing less of this, that our, less and less of this. Our fellows aren't actually going on our procurements anymore. They're not even appreciating sort of what a good pancreas and a bad pancreas looks like. When I put this talk together, I realized I have too many darn pictures on my phone of bad looking pancreata, which is a really bad sign. So my summary is this. Um, I think there's outstanding results uh, for those that receive uh, pancreas transplantation. Um, even the best technology in my mind can prevent episodes of hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. More and more of our patients who are receiving SPKs are type 2 diabetics and their outcomes continue to be equal to those in the historic type 1 diabetics. Um, we have to be careful about high BMIs, but it doesn't seem to directly impact the outcomes uh, overall. But we have to think and watch we're not pushing the, the, uh, the needle too far. Um, and finally, I think we have to uh, recognize that uh, we need to be able to, to gather as a community and say this operation is smart and it's good enough so that we start doing more of these. And so rather than sort of starting with, your, with the questions from the audience, I think we have to start asking ourselves this question. Why, why don't we start asking the question, who's not a candidate for pancreas transplant, rather than who is. Because again, I think we've found ourselves in a place where it's become too easy to say, 
probably had that continuous glucose monitor, they had that bionic pancreas, but they got their kidney. The fact of the matter is, is that the, the, the problem still associated with hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, and uncontrolled diabetes affects that kidney transplant as well. So this is my call to arms. I didn't throw anything, I promise. But I think, again, we have to take back to our institutions, whether you're in transplant or whether you or have a transplant program, and start to think more and more about utilizing this operation. It works, and I think more patients should be afforded the opportunity. So with that, I thank you and take any <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Uh, did Sarah, you can come up to if anybody has a question about this excellent presentation. Everybody wants to go get a drink, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for that passionate presentation. It's been the uh, Force behind it, thank you. So my question is, pardon me, I'm not being to be in touch with the recent literature on pancreatic transplant. Jonathan Cradell's uh, data from Indiana, is, yep. does it still stand or has it been outdated? Great question, so Jonathan Cradell, is, uh, it's, it's interesting, much like I think this community, there's you know, a, a few names in transplant, particularly pancreas transplant, who have been just stalwart you know, in their support of pancreas transplant. He continues to be um, you know, out in front of this. His data continues to be recapitulated by his, his own program and by others. What I think is important is Jonathan has not only, uh, and others, have not only presented good data, but they've also helped volunteer to be mentors to other programs. How can we help? Come out to our program, we'll show you what we do, we'll come to your place, whatever is, I think, necessary in order to continue to promote the science and the opportunity. That was an excellent talk, actually. I just want to find out, I'm a pediatric surgeon, and the Sydney American Society of Metabolic and Pediatric Surgery has reduced the BMI for the Asian population with, who's suffering from diabetes, who's on two medications. So we are doing surgery on a BMI of 27. So I want to find which has an excellent in terms of resolution of diabetes, both sleep gastric and after doing much by sleep bypass. And there's another operation which is more common, it's coming up right now, is bigger and switch. So comparing whether to the patient with a BMI of 27, will you be referring for a pediatric surgery which is easy to be done with low weight risk or sending the patient all the way for a transplant, which may have issues in terms of weight risk plus the patient has to be on the of compromised medications. Yeah, great. What do you talk about? So in general, I think the question is, is you know, the, the decision for bariatric surgery versus someone who has, um, someone who potentially is obese, metabolic syndrome, and needs exogenous insulin therapy, do we decide pancreas transplant? It's interesting now that a lot of transplant programs are now actually adding a bariatric surgery, or bariatric training, or bariatric opportunity to the programs for just that reason. Um, you know, I, I don't know that data specifically, but I certainly know that you know, we have you know, a lot of patients that go on to bariatric surgery for pancreas transplant or not, because we know long term the biggest risk after any transplant is a cardiovascular risk. The ability to control one's weight surrogate for heart health you know, is something that we take very seriously. 